So welcome to another episode of Make Some Noise with Doug DeJong. And we're running a little bit fashionably late because we're sorting out some technical issues between here and New South Wales. So uh, anybody's got any questions, we're going to be answering them live. And tonight we're talking about guitar schools, namely name dropping GIT in California. So uh, our guest tonight, he's actually attended Guitar Institute of Technology in the States and he runs his own course, and he's also been on tour with Mike Keneally and Steve Vai. So we won't hold you up any longer. So here we go. Without further ado, here he is. So Nick, how are you, sir? Do you want to maybe tell us about yourself and where you're at for a second? I'll just zoom in. There we go. Jeez, Doug. Get, um, that's a pretty good question. And hi, everyone. Where am I at? Well, at the moment, I'm being set up, obviously, because of the whole corona thing. To yeah be teaching online. I actually was in full swing with setting a cameraman with a live four camera shoot, basically, because I perform best under pressure and with a live audience or, you know, not an audience, but with live people, you know, basically right. 10 yeah. and 15 people. Because I find that then you see every, what everyone's doing and there's always someone doing the common mistakes that I've found players make, whether it be with their body, their mind, their eyes. Um, and I was getting ready for that, but I won't be running any live classes at the moment right now. So I've actually been going crazy here in my studio, repainting and setting yeah. everything up and getting old, you know, trying to get a good YouTube look because that's where we're at right now. Okay, cool. And um, I'm just sorting out some sharing there type of thing. So can you maybe tell us about your time straight off the bat where it all started back in the, I believe the 90s sometime when you attended GIT and maybe what motivated you to attend that school and maybe some of the cool stories that happened there? Yeah, absolutely. I was doing basic playing in original bands. We were doing like the 80s yeah. style thing, long hairs, no dreadlocks back then, <laughs> leather pants, you know, makeup. Oh, cool. And a lot of shredding, you know, and you know, it was it was just all that 80s guitar stuff and yeah. original gigs but you know you go through bands you singer decides that he wants to do something different and suddenly the whole band falls apart you know and then there you are starting again so i guess 10 years of that in the melbourne band circuit and oh, i actually wow. crashed i crashed my motorbike broke my collarbone Ooh. and i basically had had three months in bed lying on my back because they wouldn't operate on me and yep. I had a lot of time to think. I'm like, what am I doing? This guitar is driving me crazy. It's like all I can think about. I sit on the toilet, I'm drawing scales. I'm like, I come home from work and everyone else is on the B-O-N-G. And I'm like, they're like, Nick, come on. I'm like, no, I'm playing guitar. And I just run to my right. room and I just do like, you know, an hour and a half, two hours of scales and just shredding. And then I could come out and say, hey guys, how are you doing? It's just yeah. like, it was an obsession. And right. I basically I had to decide, fuck, I don't know, this is destroying my relationships, this is making me crazy. I know I don't right. want to play in a covers band, so I was always working in originals bands because yep. I just had mates that played in cover bands and they loved it for a year or two and then they were just kind of stuck in that grind, even yep. though the money, the money was really good back then in the 90s. Yep. And I basically decided that if I didn't find the absolute best the band exactly what I wanted, not like it was nearly what I wanted, so I'd join. Right. I would basically sell all my shit and I'd go to the States and go to GIT. So I enrolled, I did the audition tapes and all of that stuff. And Oh, then, wow, so it was uh, back back in tapes in those days? It was in tapes, absolutely. Wow. Yep, and it's cool, sent it by the mail. And right, snail mail, that's cool, yeah. man. So, you know, they got me, I was in. And then I went for an audition with a band in Melbourne and it was like the, it was like exactly what I was looking for. It, it was called 16, really silly name, but the music was epic. <laughs> the, the singer was just incredible and the whole band had a really good vibe. And yeah, but again, same shit, did a couple of shows, band fell apart. Singer just yep. broke it up, said, look, rehearsal's not on today. I'm like, oh, I've been kicked out of the band. But oh. it turns out that I rang the other guitar player and the bass player and they all got the call and they thought they'd been kicked out of the band too. And that was it. I was like, forget this. And I basically had three months to sell all my stuff and get over to the States. So I just, I did it. And then it was amazing. You know, I, I was a pretty good player. So I, I passed out of the first six months of the, of the actual two year course. Or, 
and I went basically into the mid advanced section. Oh, right. So they gave you like RPL and these days recognition of prior learning. Absolutely. Everything right. except my sight reader, my sight reading and my ear training, because I never really, okay. you know, didn't really bother too much with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's kind of how the Vi thing came about because, I mean, it was an amazing experience. I've got to say, you, all you did was live, eat and breathe guitar. You rolled out of bed in the morning at seven o'clock onto your guitar. You did your first two hours of practice. You did an hour of sight reading. Then you might have done an hour of whatever else, rhythm work or, you know, motor and did work. They, did they make you have a journal back in those days and you had to justify what you spent your time on? You didn't and have we, to justify it. Right. Sorry, Doug. What no, no, it was no, no. more about it was they gave you guidelines for the best way to learn the material. And we had obviously our core stuff that we did and then we had electives and yeah so yes we were given guidelines and we were told how much to do and what to spend our time on and how much to spend every day yeah hey chris wow so with learning your arpeggios back then did you have to learn them from you know obviously six string then all the way up did you learn your arpeggios backwards as well from the root note always well it was probably the first time we started learning things from the root note yes and it was all over the neck. It was a full caged system, but we didn't really call it a cage system or some did, some didn't, but it was basically the cage system. So yeah, yep. all the arpeggios, yes, major, minor, dominant, yep. major sevens, minor sevens, and then you could go yep. deeper into the 11s and 13s if you wanted to. Yep. Um, and, the, uh, and with uh, actually, you know, going to a brand new town, you had no idea what was going on, not just studying and learning a new regime of how to learn but did you integrate yourself into the scene did you end up going to i mean i was just in the states again in january actually i went to the states twice in a week a true story because i had to go back and play at nam but the um the baked potato i mean that's still going like what was the scene like back in the uh mid 90s i mean it was pretty was, good. The whiskey you know, and all of that was still going on. The rainbow was happening. Well, I didn't really like Nirvana, okay, because as far as they killed the 80s. They, were like, they weren't tech. Ah! They weren't tech. There was no tech. Suddenly, Guns and Roses. Guns and Roses. And, uh, I mean, they were massive in the late 80s. So, and obviously, you know, all the shred stuff would have been really, really big then. But who, who did you actually go and see on the strip? Well, I kind of, I was pretty tired on funds. I didn't see a lot of people and <laughs> okay. really my, I went there and I sold everything and my focus was guitar. It's so all I did. I woke up seven o'clock, started playing, hey, Doug. Ate, ate a little Jamie. bit, walked yep. five minutes down the road to school and basically studied all day there, came home, played all night. It's pretty much all I did. I, I did a little bit of surfing with my housemates, but I was there for a reason and I was incredibly <laughs> focused. I didn't drink. I didn't do anything except play guitar. And, and I kind of ate quite vegetarian too at the time, which was wow. weird for me. Wow. But it was less time in food preparation and more time on my guitar. <laughs> that's why I was there, man. It was, it was all I wanted to do. It was a dream to just six months straight be playing 12 to 16 hours a day. You know, whether it be like in, with band stuff at school, jamming with people or just doing, doing what had to be done. Did you uh, actually study with, you know, shoulder to shoulder with anyone who went onwards and upwards? Not that I can think of. Um, there was, it was not necessarily in, in the guitar vein. There was a really good drummer mate of mine, Carl. He ended up playing with some of the, uh, some of the guys from some basically mm -hmm. ah, a pile of black funk guys that were involved with James Brown and Funkadelic. Oh, wow. So as, and he was a white guy playing as a drummer. So that was amazing. And, I went back a couple of years later and stayed with him for three months and learned some really amazing things from him that he'd learned by hanging out with these black guys about rhythm. And because my perspective about playing a music really changed when I went on tour with Vi. And so cool. So it, in keeping the timeline chronologically, so you did your GIT thing. So when when did you actually tour with Vi and all that kind of stuff? Did that happen straight away from GIT or? It was straight away from GIT in that six months, hey, six months in wow. I, that was when I basically I left school to go on tour. And what oh, actually wow. happened was Steve's manager used to run a business course at GIT. And she always talked about 
basically interning slash working for free. And one day she was talking about Steve's guitar tech, Roger Bell, at the time. Yeah, and cool. How, stre how stressed he was on tour. And I just went, I stuck my hand up and I went, I'll intern, yeah. And she said, yeah, great idea, Nick. Come and talk to me at the end of class. And so I'd always, my very first guitar, I pulled it apart. It was in pieces and I had to actually pull it apart to rewire in all the pickups to make it work. And I learned <laughs> on the run, basically, on, right. about that tech like, side of things. Like we did tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then, so uh, more reason to not go to gigs. Then I got, there was this guy, Roman, who basically built guitars and fixed guitars for the legends. Like when Malmsteen broke his guitar into four pieces or three pieces, he came yeah. into Roman's shop, which was literally a stone's throw from GIT, just between Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset. Yeah. And he, and Malmsteen came in, you'll fix my guitar. And he said, get the fuck out of my shop. <laughs> and so, Oh. Mom's team basically came back multiple times because that was the kind of guy that Roman was, but he was genius with what he did. So it, I had to go in there 10 times begging him to be his, uh, to work for free, basically. Look, man, wow. I'll sand the carpet, I'll sand the floor, I'll do whatever you need. I just, I need to brush up my skills a little bit. I've got this opportunity coming up. And about the 10th time, it was like, okay, come on in. So I'd be doing <laughs> guitar during the day until about, 10 o'clock at night and then I'd go to the guitar shop and I'd work till two or three in the morning just building guitars wow. with, um, with Roman. So that's all I did. It was, and then basically I met Steve. I did, a couple, I did the photo shoot for the first with Joe Satriani and Eric Johnson for the first G3 G3? tour. Yeah, and I remember those. Yeah, wow. That was like, again, 90, that was probably 96. And then Steve said, yeah, okay, cool. He can, he can come to the mothership. So I came to the mothership and then I got there yeah. and Roger, and Roger yeah. Bell, Steve's tech goes, what are you doing here, mate? We've, there's, there's no job for you. You're not needed. Just why don't you go home? And I said, mate, I'm here and I'm going to show you that you need me. Even if I drive the bus, I'm coming on this tour. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So with the uh, working at the guitar shop, did you learn some really cool tricks and with, was it majorly repairs for touring guitarists back then or was it actually you know make, making and designing custom stuff it was building custom stuff and roman would do most of the work and then you know i'd eat, i'd be doing the sanding or i'd be watching by absorbing just listening to him talk and just being there in the shop sometimes just just literally watching and yeah so that's kind of what happened there and yeah right so you so you actually left GIT, is that right then? I was at GIT at the time. And then yeah. what happened was after two weeks with the pre-production for the uh, first G3 tour. Wow. We, we, the first show that we did was at Universal Studios. Oh, I know actually at the Rock and Roll Cafe, um, Hard Rock Cafe in Universal Studios. And it's, that's where Steve gave away the double neck heart guitar. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So that was the first pre-production for the tour. And then during that tour, Rog came up to me and said, you're coming on the tour, there's mate. A, hey, Remco. Yeah. Was this with Ed Roman? No, it was Roman was his first name. And his, oh, who knows, Remco, show me a picture and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know then. But yeah, and then basically I was on the tour and basically my main job on the tour was was teching. I was doing keyboard, guitar and bass guitar tech. I yep. basically, but during rehearsals, I noticed that there was a lot of samples that was being used and there was parts that Steve couldn't feel because, or Mike couldn't feel because you know, there were like three or four or five part harmony. So I was like, Hey, Steve, I can play that bit. <laughs> so oh, wow. Wow. Basically what happened was Steve told me to I'd actually already been learning parts of the attitude song and all the harmonies and stuff. Seven, people. eight. Yeah, far out. What a piece that was. <laughs> Fuck, I love it. Took it. me ages. And, but I was also playing keyboard parts and feeling for bits here and there in some of the songs so that Mike could run off and do things. So I got to play a little bit on the, on the G3 tours, but I got to play a little bit more on the actual Fire Garden tour where, you know, it was us and we didn't have to, we weren't going to possibly annoy other bands or other roadies because there's a whole hierarchy because, you know, Fire wasn't the headliner, Satriani was. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Back back on the Fire Garden tour. Yes. Oh, wow. I, I, when I was having techo problems, I could hear that alarm going off. Woo, woo, woo. 
Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, it's funny, you know, when when I actually went and spoke to Steve um, in New York, actually, I learned this story that he actually engaged Satriani's first deal because like, was Vi is a business guru. You know, he is yeah. he's living and breathing not just the music but the music business all the time, and he's he's an entrepreneur. And I, I had no idea yeah. that he pulled the trigger on Satriani's first record to make it happen. Did, yeah, or do did. you have any info, any info on that? Well, I just know that he um, introduced Joe. He's like, I've actually got this mate who's a really good guitar player. In fact, he was my teacher. And he kind of did the <laughs> setup introduction once, you know, he was in. Wow. There was, always, there was always a really funny tension between Joe and Steve. They absolutely love each other. And, but Steve always feels like, guy he's not paying me enough it's like it's not respectful and oh. and then you know because joe was the headliner joe it was joe's tour joe basically had organized all you know it was his brainchild and he had the full back you know all the staging and the and the lighting and and basically so steve was definitely an absolutely major part because he's been part of almost every well, every one i don't know i haven't followed lately um and then always a third member would be the one that would change right so that's the G3 concept we're talking about here. Yeah. G3 in the back of the night. I think I actually saw that tour with uh, Eric playing. And so, because I think now Steve does the uh, Generation Axe, like he's one of five and he's got um, Tosin Abasi, Nuno Betancourt, uh, Zach Wild, and who's the other guy? I remember it when I asked. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. Oh, no, I, I probably know who you're talking about, but I actually haven't had my finger on the pulse for a little bit. Little, I've kind oh, of okay. been like focused on family and kind of even just look back. I just realized it's actually been five years since I've ran a class. Yeah, and wow, it, that's it does awesome. my, it totally does my head in because I've done so many. And yep. I think that it's it's great that I'm back here. I, I know that because in, in my work, um, um, I'm an electrician by trade, which really helped me be able to obviously deal with the electrical side of yep. amps Mel's equipment. Seen. Cool. Yep. Yeah, Mum's saying. Um, hey, Shinny, how you doing? <laughs> and um, that's 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 a good point about you know even now, uh, Tom Nordek. You probably heard of Tom. He's like Steve's guitar tech now. He used to work for Frank Zappa. Mm-hmm. I can actually say now, a personal friend of Tom's as well. So he showed me the um, the tech right now that goes into eliminating hums like it's it's a science and i just can't believe how much they even go to they still run lots of things on battery and they've got these new super battery things i've never seen before they Mm -hmm. run as much gear as they can on isolated systems so it there's no there's no uh, what they call it there's no ground hum if there's no only ground exists if they're connected but so if they're all individual there's no ground hum and i was like oh wow cool I mean, this might be rudimentary for an electrician, but it was like, this is cool. Hey, here we go. I think Malston was the other guitarist. That's it? Yes, it was. Yeah, sorry, what were you going to say? Well, if we're talking about the same Tom, because there was a point where the guitar techs changed, I think, on the second G3 tour. And I think we, we were in Detroit City on the side of the river. And this guy had an accent. So, I mean, I can't say for sure, but yeah, Tom seems yeah, very close. Him. And he's he like, sounds like, Arnold, something like that. Arnold, he sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's Austrian, I think. Okay, cool. So I did work with him for half a tour. And we were in Detroit and there was a massive amount. We actually had a bit of a radio station coming through Vise Rig. And he, that was when Steve was running his, his uh, red Vi labeled cable. And Tom was like, Tom pulled out one piece, one patch cable of his cable or whatever he liked to use at the time. And he put it in between in one section, took out one patch and put this one and the noise gone. It was amazing. Yes, because he has a background in uh, television because he used to film the Frank Zappa thing. He actually shot a lot of the Vi playing back in the day. So he has an wow. understanding of electronics. And actually, he he's a pioneer in, uh, you know, like in your iPhone right now, there's a geo sensor, mm-hmm. you know how you play a game. He's actually yep. put geo sensors in a guitar. So that when you when you play the guitar and you move the guitar, it actually it's it's like a three D uh, X Y and Z axis in space to trigger you know effects. If that makes sense, I think we just yeah of course head off there. Uh, of course yeah my head's back now. Why, why not use a noise gate? Yeah, that's probably a good point. That's a good point. 
But um, getting just before we move on to what you're doing now with your your guitar school and stuff, but is there any other like road stories about you know touring with Vi? There are so many road stories about touring with Vi. Oh, top um, three, top three, top three. Well, I can't talk about that one. Um, okay, or maybe no were, names or were, places. Well, just... well, I think I think it's more important to talk about what a gentleman, what a consummate professional Steve was. I, I I've seen Nordic. I've seen That's us it. be on a show and they wired the entire board wrong. So the, the it was all backwards. One was like thirty six, and thirty six was one. And Steve was getting buzz off the mic and the gear that we were meant to have at that show because obviously it depending on we were this was doing the fire garden tour then you basically give them a spec of what you expect to have there because you can only fit so much stuff in the truck and he just said instead of losing it like some people would he just basically said okay boys this is wrong you need to fix this i'll be back in half an hour during sound check that was incredible and again another one that really sticks out to me is we were in boston and during the jam between Satch and Eric Johnson and Vi, yeah. it was, something was different about what Vi did. He just did what he did instead of trying to do the blues during the jam at the end. Yeah. And I was walking out. He, I was, he asked me to escort him around to the bus. Um, and we were walking around, and I was telling him how amazing it was. And then this guy, because I guess I was in this moment of like, oh, my God, Steve, that was amazing. And then this guy selling hot dogs goes, hey, mate, I think I saw you today. That was incredible. What's your name again? And Steve goes, oh, it's Steve I, and was extremely polite with him. And then as we walked off, I said, oh, my God, how does that make you feel, Steve? Like he you forgot your name. And he was just like, well, why should he remember my name, Nick? You know, I'm totally fine. Which made me really, I guess, I don't know, that humbled me quite a bit to just realize that, you know, how he would talk to everyone with this absolute sense of peace. Yeah. Um, I guess the highlight, another highlight for me, though, I mean, there were so many, it was on that same trip in Boston, we got on the tour bus and there was this really big overweight guy that looked like he just got out of jail with tattoos everywhere. And I was kind of being, I was in my judgmental thing and I was like, what's this guy doing on a bus? Oh, bus, he doesn't belong here. I walked past him and I've actually got a very faded now tattoo of a gem on my arm that I got when I was like 21 which yeah, I actually wow. didn't show at all because I didn't want Steve to know that I was one of these guys that had a tattoo of his stuff. All these people <laughs> would come up and get their tattoos signed show after show, and I didn't really want yeah. Steve to know that I was a fan. Yeah. And then so, they would go and get it tattooed on. Yeah, right. Yep, absolutely. So <laughs> Boston was the first place I actually wore a tank top with my tattoo out. And as I got on the bus, this guy goes, this big, this big overweight, bikey-looking dude goes, you've got my guitar tattooed on your arm. I'm like, huh? And he goes, I'm Joe. I designed and built that guitar for Steve. So he was the original designer of Jen's wow. guitar. And I was blown away. So I, I got to sit and hang with him for quite a while. And then he asked me to play at our next show, which I think was across the river in Jersey. He asked me to play his new gem, which was this unbelievable, futuristic looking, sharp pointed thing. But the only photos I've got are photos of the guitar with heads <laughs> covering oh. the guitar, except the headstock. I'm like, no. Oh, so with that guy who designed the gem, like, did he give you any, because you were building guitars, like, what, what did you guys discuss about how that came about? Mm, a little bit, but there are, there are some backstory things that are not necessarily so cool. And I really can't talk about with the whole yep. gem scenario and Ibanez and all of that so just going to stay off that one Done. for a little bit okay fair enough do you know why um well maybe you do so what i've been told is that you know why it's called the gem why don't you tell me and i'll tell you if i knew that and but forgot uh, okay that's cool because i mean you could probably see mine i've got a 7 bsb right here at there mm -hmm. behind me mm -hmm. can see i me? can yeah Over i can here. now right, right. seven seven bsb it's a head, mm -hmm. head. Mm -hmm. so gem He's a Gemini. That's his astrology sign. So it's the Gem and I. Gemini. So, oh, wow. Because he's a Jimi Hendrix fan. So, you know. 
wow, extent, that's amazing. Ex, extension of self really really deep so yeah just looking at your gem kind of made me just reminded me and made me kind of have a little bit of a like uh, a moment like when i got to hollywood one thing that i really wanted to do was buy my gem so in in one of the stores on on hollywood on sunset boulevard just down from um the guitar center one of the little boutique ones i found a floral gem one of the original ones from the original yeah. you know curtains that he had and still had in the studio when i went there it was like <gasps> so i bought i got my gem and which was amazing and i i took it on tour with us or with you know and i if you go to my youtube page um at visionary guitar youtube whatever or there's actually yep. a, a uh, there's a video of the tour bus that burnt down so our tour bus burnt down and almost everything that was in it was lost and I was sleeping because I wouldn't. I slept with my guitar, and so there it was in the in the bunk, and it was. I remember Steve was like, we heard all this noise, and Steve woke us up. And he goes, "Get off the bus! The bus is on fire!" And it was almost wow. a joke because we were on the fire garden tour, and oh, but he, he was like, "No, Nick, get the get off the bus now!" So you you didn't even think to grab your boots. You kind of got off, you maybe grabbed your pants that were next to you or something, and we all charged <laughs> off the bus. Like my guitar was right there next to me, and I didn't grab it. It was, and then we all got off the bus thinking it was going to blow up, but we didn't realize, or we went, we just didn't know that diesel doesn't blow up. Because so, it's got a different match, match point, yeah. That's right. So 10 minutes later, or it probably felt like a, an hour, we're going, the bus hasn't blown up yet, and we've realized all the stuff we've got on there. We've got passports, my guitar, the G3 tapes, the, the tapes mm -hmm. for the live, the very first G3 CD that came out, the live tapes, the masters, they were on the bus underneath. Oh. So we tried to get back on the bus when we realized what was happening, but it was so smoke filled, it wasn't happening. And if you watch the video, you'll just see, literally just burns to flames, it's, it's quite amazing. And my gem burnt down on that, on that tour. Wow. So. That's the story about I have not bought another gem since then, but I did own one for six months. I spent a lot of time on it. <laughs> and well, I'm I sorry actually, to laugh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. I actually, my brother was a really big part in helping me be able to do the tour, financing me in that, yeah. um, you know, I only when I needed money, he was there to help. So I actually had the body, the body was still burnt to bits. It's on the video. The neck was gone. Oh, but I, so you actually, you got it back. I got it back out of the out of the shards and I got my boots as well, which now I still wear. I had a guy fix them after oh. a couple of boot people kicked me out and said, get out of here, mate. I can't fix them. But back right. to my guitar, I brought it back to Australia and I, I basically made a collage of a whole pile of tour shots and I presented it to my brother to say thanks um, for everything that he'd done. So the wow. guitar's in Melbourne now, unplayable, wow. but it's yes. a piece of history and that's my gem, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think wow. I'm going to, you know, be able to buy one. And, but I have replaced it with something really special, which I might show you. Yes. Basically. Cool. So there's, what can we see here? So this is my main guitar nowadays, but this one here. So this is basically, this is a 550. Just, it was a black 550 that I took with me. Yep. And, but at Bauman, if you, anyone remembers Bauman, Hang on, I'll, just zoom, built, I'll just zoom in for you. There we go. Yeah, Bal, Bauman built me this. Uh, I'll put it. Bauman built me this beautiful neck here, um, that was based off an exotic wood Ibanez that I had. But what I really love about this guitar is that gold nut there. Yep. And is I basically took off Evo because there was a point on a show where Evo was having some problems fretting out, and I basically had to change the nut. So I pocketed that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and these 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 pickups are, are also came out of one of the guitars that you know Steve would break a guitar every night, so I grabbed yep. these as well. So this is yeah. So they're obviously wow. you know vise paths. I painted them green, kind of. Um, so yep. there's a pile of things in here that kind of are uh, my my remake of my gem. It's my gem updated version. Okay. Wow, um, we got I've got a couple of questions here for you, Nick. It yep. says here, uh, what happened to that curly maple gem that you had, Nick? It was Hey, beautiful. Dustin. Yeah, the purple one. Yeah, you, you still got was it? Was that the purple one, Dustin? Um, that was, yeah, I had to sell that to do the tour. So 
that neck that I just showed you, I had Bellman copy me exactly because it had it's got the slight, it's got the most beautiful radius on it, and it's super thin. So, it, was it the guitar that got toasted? No, no, that, that was just a basic. Oh, that was just a floral gem, one of Vi's Ibanez's. And the reason why he, his white guitar called Flow was actually a floral guitar repainted white, right? Yeah, That's why right. it's called um, Flow. I, I didn't know that. And uh, Evo, he had a fascination with uh, Harleys. Cause I, yes, he I did. Know. He had a couple of them in his garage. <laughs> and that's where Evo came from. It's the name of the engine, the Evolution engine. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, I've got to say, hey, Justin. So good to hear from you, man. <laughs> uh, nice score with the... Uh, Crikey, Lucy. Hey, Lucy. Hey, Lucy. So and, Lucy uh, is Lucy knows me from way back. Hey Lucy, remember I was um I had the hots for her because she used to work in a um in a, in a music shop selling CDs. And every time I went to Tassie to see my dad, she'd be spinning, she'd be putting me on the Def Leppard and all these really cool <laughs> bands. And she was like this, you know, three, four year old, older than me, hot, eighties chick. <laughs> Lucy, you still are, babe. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, hey mate. Okay, we have another one. Hi, Nick. Uh, cool to see you in hey, your Jet. gear. Yeah, and, Chet's, uh, uh, Chet's an old student, and we we haven't been in touch for quite a while now, but um, we have. Yeah, Justin, it was the reddish one. Yeah, I know, man. I worked a year to buy that. and uh, The whew. HR hold. <laughs> Backstories. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my dad's car. Nick. Hey, Greg. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. So, so uh or shucks. Student two. <laughs> <laughs> or they sometimes the uh, the because there's about a five second delay. That's why they they're hearing it after us. So okay, cool. Um, yeah, because uh, I've actually got to play with Steve and all that as well. And actually, I've heard. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I'm a, as you can probably tell, I'm a bit of a guitar nerd. Yeah, bit even, of a shredder, I do believe. Uh, yeah, you can say that. You can say that. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I. What I really like is not just the guitar player, but as I was saying before at the beginning of our chat, is the just the business acumen and all, always seeing the wider picture all the time. You know, it's just mm. very, very inspirational. But any other, um, so was that two stories about on tour? Do you have one more? Um, Maybe not? Yes, I do. I, okay. I, I have that's one good. that's kind of a... a it kind of had a lot to do with changing my view on being a shredder or, or I guess my musical direction for want of a better term. So uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't, you know, here I am, I'm on tour. Like our first show was up like Concord Pavilion up in San Francisco or something. And there was 5,000 people. So I'm like, all right, we were, we were actually, I think we were first on and Eric Johnson was after us and then it was Satch. So, after we'd packed up and done what we had to do, I, I went straight to the office and I got backstage passes or I got them earlier on and I went cruising around because I'm like, I've got backstage passes, going to find some girls because that's why we picked the guitar up in the first place, right? Girls. Right. Eat. Yes, <laughs> girls. <laughs> so there I am. I'm, I've got backstage. Um, yes, for you, for you, darling. And I cruised around the whole audience and I couldn't find any girls that weren't with blokes. It was like 95% male <laughs> audience. So I'm like, okay, all right, cool. I'll just go and check out, watch, watch Satch and, you know, get on with my stuff. And then the next show was Hollywood Bowl, 11,000 people or 13. So same thing. I, you know, I'm like cruising before looking for girls, I'm cruising after looking for girls. I can't find any girls. And then, so like, we're halfway across the country. We're like probably 15 shows in and I'd turn up at the office for my passes and they'd be like, really, Nick, you're going to have another go. You do know this is the cock tour, don't you? And the, <laughs> again, the rules were if you got girls backstage, if there were girls backstage, no one was allowed, no one in the crew was allowed to go near them except the person that brought them backstage. Oh, and all right. the crew Un members. Unwritten law. Yeah, unwritten, unwritten law. So, because it was the cock tour, and otherwise you were cock blocking, as they like to, <laughs> like to call it back then. So you just had to watch. You had to be like, "Oh my god, he found some girls." So I and so what that did for me was, all my conversations were, um, what picks are Steve using? And of course, we gave out heaps of picks. Um, what strings is he using, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And 
I was like, where are the chicks? Where are the screaming chicks? <laughs> right? Like the Skid Row video, right? Where's the screaming chicks? All uh, right, yes. Right? So I kind of went, hmm, okay, 10 hours a day practicing, which I kind of love, but 10 hours a day practicing. And then I go to play shows to men. Where's the chicks? Okay. Um, so I kind of went, okay, well, I love this style of guitar. It kind of made me go, kind of made me recognize what, who, who we were as an audience and who was watching and made me kind of think about my musical. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of, that was a, re- that was a really big tool story for me because I basically, <laughs> I, it was, it was very nice. And that, and the funny story is I used to have a Tirana as Justin will know, and I actually bought my first Marshall head and I bought my, and then I was like, I need a quad box. So I went to buy it through the good old trading post, drove to this guy's place. And my Tirana was uh, LC coupe, a two door, oh. tiny little thing. Right. And I get the quad to the car and I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to fit it in the car? So we've got the seats forward. We've got the doors open. We're in front and back, getting it into the back seat. And I'm like, I need a new car. <laughs> because I've got to have this quad box, you know. I need to have a big amp. <laughs> right. Yes, of course. So that's when I bought the shag and wagon. Thanks, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so after you said that, just to get back on that story, you're saying that that's where you stopped if you couldn't find any girls, so you stopped pursuing the shred? Well, <laughs> I did. I did. I went, yep. Because... <laughs> What happened, right, is Kenny Wayne Shepherd came on tour. So he was on the second G3 tour, and suddenly there were girls at the shows. And wow. I'd be out there after the Vi show, and then Kenny would be on, and I'd, I'd see a group of, like, six girls, ladies. And I would walk <laughs> over, and I'd kind of stand there, and I'd say hello. And I'd be like, got some passes, got me a little tool pass hanging around. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, who are you with? And I'm like, yeah, I'm with Steve Vai. We were just on, he goes, oh, yeah, oh, he was a good guitar player. Yeah, that was kind of nice. But, of course, they were there to see. I mean, Kenny was incredible. To watch him sometimes yeah. side of stage was the first time I, I think I ever really appreciated the blues from a shredding. Yeah. I was a shredder. I'm like, what? What do you mean? The scales have only got five notes in them. That's not enough. <laughs> I've got two more, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but that made me think, wow, if you have a singer or you're playing a different style, here's Kenny being able to play some cool riffs and still rip up some amazing solos. But have an entirely different feel to what he was doing and, and it, get a different kind of audience. And suddenly there were more people dancing instead of people just staring and going, tap, tap, tap. Hey, did you see that lick? And right. I guess, yeah, that made me really rethink my direction. That okay. and, you know, I'd been at GIT for six months and I'm going to kind of come back to this story because <laughs> this is really important to my... <laughs> I, I, and just on the Kenny Wayne Shepherd, before you go back to that story, uh, he wrote a song with Mark Selby, Blue on Black. I mean, I still do a version of that today. And Beautiful I'm a, song. I met Kenny Wayne when he uh, played here. I think he was supporting Mike Stern, or, I think. Yep, yep. And a uh, great guitar player. Or was it Alan Holdsworth? I can't remember, but yeah. I went yeah. Anyway, back to your story. Well, Kind of like after being at GIT and playing, doing that 12, 14, 16 hours a day kind of scenario, what happened was when I got and doing all this ear training that they were saying, you know, listening to notes and having to write them down, I kind of, six months later, I was just a better machine. I still wasn't really improvising like I thought I'd like to be improvising. And I was really kind of, I was already a good machine before I got there, but I was better. And yeah. obviously I'd learned, I, like when I got, when I did my interview for GIT. I could play all my all my modes anywhere on the neck in any key. I'm like, yeah, what key do you want, mate? Where do you want it? Yeah. How fast do you want it? So I, when I went on tour, a lot of things happened because I basically spent a lot of time talking in between towns with, with Mike Keneally and um, Steve Vai and, of course, and the drummer, which I'm having trouble thinking of his name right now. Jeremy Mike Colson. Mangini. No, we had Mike Mangini on tour. Oh, you, oh really? Yeah, he's, he's and Mike amazing. was obviously amazing mates with Nuno, but he wrote a book called Rhythm Knowledge, which was all about how he trained to be able to, he was ambidextrous. He could swap, his, his drum kit was a mirror, and he could swap between left and right-handed playing anywhere in a beat. And I remember, my, I remember Steve saying, 
he is more metronome, he's better metronome than a metronome is. And of course, it, any great player has spent time with a metronome because what it actually does is it trains your muscles to fire in time. And yeah. it trains your synapses in your brain to connect to that so that you have this yeah. basic rhythm. Uh, because otherwise, and then they learn to have their emotions within the feel of that pulse of those muscles firing in time, as opposed to slowing down and speeding up to create emotion, which of course doesn't really work very well for the rest of the people in the band or the people who are trying to dance. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's so important learning how to use that metronome, but learning how to use it well. And so I learned so much from Mike Keneally about that and his ideas about muscle training and memory retention and practice routines. And we've got to remember, I've just come off GIT, one of the top guitar schools in the world and still is with some of the most amazing teachers. Like, you know, I did lessons with Mike Stern, among other people. It wasn't just rock that I was studying. Obviously, we were studying mm. jazz too. And so yeah. I, was, I, was, I even did some of the electives on how to learn and how to practice. I so, love that. This stuff, this is good. Amazing stuff on just incredible stuff. And, but I did everything they said to the T. Because like I said, I was just, <laughs> I was there. And I was, paying, I was paying a fortune to be there and with accommodation and course fees. And it was like 3,000 US a term back then. So, wow. which was a lot of money in 95. And yep. so here I am suddenly on tour and I'm watching, I'm watching Soundcheck and I'm watching Mike Neely and Steve Vai and, and Philip Bino on bass just come up with a song, a whole song. And I'm like, oh, what album's that on, Steve? And he's like, oh, we just wrote it then. And he, he just, you know, would record it on his, um, on his, it wasn't an 8-track band. No, no, we were, <laughs> we're talking, you know, ADAT. It was, he was on an ADAT back then. I think that's yeah. the right word. Well, he um, still does that today. He still, like, does that, that jam thing. It's part of the uh, ceremony before playing. Mm, yeah, so watching them do that kind of blew me away. And mm. especially watching Mike Keneally do it every, every night with Beer for Dolphins when they were supporting the Fire Garden Tour. They would do one song in the set that was entirely made up. And you would definitely never know anything about it at all. So, yes, all right, good. Let's, let's go there. So what happened was on tour, I didn't actually have a lot of time to practice my scales. Everything was kind of, um, everything was, there was just, you'd get off the bus and you'd start working straight away. You were boom. Right. Restringing guitars, setting stuff up until the moment you went to bed, basically, except when I was looking for girls, right? So... <laughs> After, oh after, my god! After the first three months on tour, it was Christmas, and I got back to Hollywood, and I went to actually go. Wow, I've got some time to practice, and I went to do the stuff that I'd my practice routines from GIT, and I couldn't remember them. I mentally couldn't remember how to do these things that I had spent six months doing after just having a three month break. So I, that kind of really threw me a lot. I was like, "Well, that's no good. That's not something's wrong. Something's wrong mm. with this." Um, hey, Luce. Um, yeah, so something, something, something wrong, was with, wrong with this method of method. teaching that I was forgetting things. Like I don't want to practice things every day to learn, I mean, to be able to retain that information. So in, in the three months leading into the next tour, I kind of moved to a small beachside town called Biz, Bismo Beach, halfway between LA and um, San Francisco, basically where San Luis Obispo is, where I believe the Ernie Ball guitars are now, and yep. where the Simpsons Still. were based. Believe it or not, there's a nuclear yes. plant just up the road. Well, that's where I lived. Um, amazing oh, wow. beach town and really got involved in the American culture. And I took on private students at that wow. time to help pay my bills and surf and looked for girls. So <laughs> moving right along. At least, at least you're consistent. Yep. Consistent, yes. And I basically went on a road trip and with a mate and he was getting his teeth done. I was waiting there for three days and there was this course, Kevin Trudeau, Mega Memory, who talked all about memory pegs and visualization. Or oh, actually I was also doing some, basically he talked about memory pegs and how to lock things onto things. So like you, you instead of, if you wanted a telephone number and then, and the first two numbers were nine, two, well, nine would nine. Well, I'm going to go one because it was all about rhyming words. One was a gun, you know, two was a shoe, three was yeah. a tree. So you I actually, actually, I actually still do that today. Memory Palace, and I teach people how to use Memory Palace. And yeah, sorry, but anyway, keep going. Yeah, no. So you're right. So you would link things to numbers, not names, because if you think about it, you've gone to school with someone, and or worked with someone for five years, six years, ten years, 
they even could have been your best friend and you you know everything about them you know how many kids they've got maybe you know maybe but what you don't remember when you see them over there walking through the mall is you don't actually you're like oh my god it's and you can't remember their name you remember everything about them but you don't want to go up and talk to them because you can't remember their name so and then you know it might come five minutes later if you have the balls to go up and talk to them and then it pops up and as you go and you say see you jeremy it was so good to see you and you're like yes and what i realized was that the brain the way it pulls up information like a name is a scientific term it doesn't actually it's not a picture unless you link it somehow or turn that word jeremy into a picture so that's why we practice songs for example or sheet music. We, you know, how many people who actually you know play from sheet music can play a standard or you know, piano players, for example, they can play that piece. They may have been playing it for five years, but you take that piece of paper away and they can't even play the first, sometimes the first line, let alone the whole page. But they swear that they don't need that bit of paper to play that piece, but they still have it there. So what it actually is, it's a memory jog because they haven't turned that, because they've learned from like the, left-hand side of the brain, the one that's linked to their right hand, the one that's all about science and um, mathematical terms. It has no feelings. It's like yeah. our mathematical equations from school. Now, we don't remember the mathematical equations from school, even though we passed all the tests with them because we don't use them on a regular basis. So, yeah. but if we think about another form of memory, if we think about, I want you to think about grade six in primary school, and I want you to think about walking out of your classroom and I want you to think about walking down the hallway and out into the playground. And how many steps did it take for you to walk down into the playground and what color were they? And did you turn left? Did you turn right? Where were the water fountains? You know, where was the oval that you played games on? Where was the toilets? And all of this stuff you haven't thought about for 20 years, 30 years, whatever that might be. But you can, you can now put that vision into words and tell me the answer to my question. Yeah. So that's the way that I have learned to see my scales and all the information on music theory so that when I need it, I can basically think of a picture and it comes up for me to use right there immediately because I have a few pegs to pull it out of my memory. Mm. So I That's... I use a lot of tools like, um, sorry, Doug. No, 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 let's go. I really... Tool, I'll have a breath of water. <laughs> That's cool. I really, I'm enjoying what you're saying because um, similar to yourself, I went and did a jazz course in jazz performance guitar but I'm a shredhead normally, but I play lots of styles, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, and I've got an honors in composition and I'm also an instrumental teacher specialist. I went to the con and did all that kind of stuff back Beautiful. in the day. So not that that means anything because you know, when you're doing it on the, on the job, every single student sees it differently, but you said something that really resonates with me, memory peg. So an example would be, so when I teach, um, you know, one, four, five, chords yep. so i call that l theory right so it looks yep. like an l so that if they want to understand where that's where one four five is but the two is a tone up so from the from the l upstairs where the root note is it's a tone up a tone up to the two and a tone or and a semitone down to seven yeah right and then on the next string uh, a semitone down is the third and a tone and go to the fifth and a tone up is from is the sixth right so with one picture of the l i can show a student a seven note scale from a, a visual yeah I'm from really, a visual reference point right so yeah. and then that's just getting it started because if you can think of an l you do this really really quick i mean and this is just a process of learning it i mean because when, when mm -hmm. you're actually in the moment um you need to find your way, but then you, if you're actually engaging, like we are talking, we're not actually thinking we're just doing. And the next step is practicing being in the state of flow to get everything going up. But anyway, what else were you going to say about, um, <laughs> well, that? I was, well, I guess what happened after that, after getting back from that first tour and realizing that I couldn't remember all that stuff and I had to open my book to get a rejigger. Um, cool, man. Yeah. That's cool. for you, Nick. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate that, bro. Yeah. Greg, We've had so much fun. I actually, I love teaching and, and that time that we have with students, you know, it's like, it's, they're not really students, they're friends and it's kind of hard to stay in touch with everyone and, and keep track of what uh, everyone's doing. I'll just quickly read this one out to keep it uh, consistent. Guthrie Govan says that some interesting things about how music is like a language. 
Well, it is a language. Yes, I agree. And words are not just full string of letters in the alphabet. Yeah, when it's, So when improvising, you're literally speaking, talking, communicating something with your playing. I, I'm glad he brought that up because, you know, that's how everyone has their own way. That's another thing too, being a teacher, is that everyone has their own way of conceptualization. You know, and it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. And I, I actually did a video. I don't have my little pencil here. So here is, uh, here we go, I've got a little dodgy. Here is uh, a circle, that's called knowledge. So here is one person here on this side and that's their perspective. Cool, they see yeah, it that totally. way. Totally, absolutely, and, yes. And then another person can be on this side and they see it this way, okay? Um, the Correct. knowledge is knowledge. It doesn't mean someone's wrong. They just see it differently. But anyway, Nick, what were you going to say? That's very, uh, that's very PC of you, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, what I was going to say, and um, obviously I know that we're kind of running out of time. Is, oh, no, no, it's, it's cool. It's cool. Oh, well, cool. We can just go. wave. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. No. If you've got to go, you've got to go. But if not... Um, what I, I kind of... A lot of things happened on tour and a lot of things happened talking with the guys saying, like, how did you learn? saying to Mike Neely, how did you learn to play? Because I guess, well, I'm, a, I, I'm really glad this memory has came up for me because Mike Keneally, I thought Steve was good until I saw Mike Keneally. Now, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. One night we were in the studio for pre-production. We, sorry, we were, we were rehearsing for the, for the G3 tour. And what happened was Mike at about 10 p.m., maybe 9 p.m. at the end of rehearsals that day, Mike Keneally said to Steve, Steve, are we going to do the, uh, the Jack, uh, I can't even think of the right name, but basically the devil, the devil challenge, Eugene's bag trick from Crossroads. And right. Steve said, yes, we're going to do it here. He reached over and he said, here's the videotape. Here you go. So then Mike grabbed it and went home. So basically, we probably left the studio about 10. And Mike Keneally, I know he had an hour drive to get home from Hollywood Hills. And he was back in the studio tomorrow, the next morning at 9, 10 a.m. And no one else really had arrived. I'd arrived to start, you know, doing some setup stuff. And I heard him playing the entire duel, note for note perfect at full speed. And I said, oh, Mike, did you already know that? He said, oh, no, I just put the video and watched it, worked it out. I'm like, Mike, you probably had like two hours with sleep and driving and saying hi to your family. And what do you mean? Like, and then... So in the studio that day at some point, Steve goes, so, sorry, Mike says, Steve, let's do the jewel. Let's have a crack. Steve goes, you're not ready. Mike goes, yeah, I'm ready. He goes, I just gave it to you yesterday. And he goes, yeah, let's go. So <laughs> boom, they go into the jewel and it's note for note perfect, the whole thing, right? Wow. Steve, Steve gets to the end and he says to Mike, Mike, I wrote that. I played it. It took me three days to relearn it. What the hell? Right? Like, <laughs> so suddenly my radar went like, Steve Vai, God, God, God to <gasps> Mike Keneally. Right. It, was, yeah, it was. And so I, like I said, I spent a lot of time talking with the boys about, because obviously they were more accessible than, than Vi was in respect to just Vi's yep. personal time. And so, you know, and the, he'd have his own private lounge down the back of the bus. Not that he didn't want, hang out with us all the time, but I had full access to Mike and Mike Keneally and Mike Mangini and Philip Bino on how they learned. And it was, it was just mind boggling. It was totally changing my approach to things. Plus, like I said, running into this memory course. And also I was, I got this book that kind of like fell off the shelf, like kind of what happens about, visualization and, and it was called it was something called dancing mind something body it was still body and it was about visualizing everything that you did dancing mind still body is it dance some yeah it was dancing mind quiet body something like that it was it would have been published back there in like you know 95 96 yeah right and I'll check basically it, out. it talked about and it's it was probably one of the earlier books talking about things that came off someone else's ideas about visualization that moved on and Basically, it talked about how your brain repeats the ideas or repeats. Your, once you've taught yourself some, how to do something physically and you've repeated enough times, that's how your body does it. So that's why when you've played a lick a hundred times and you keep making the mistake in the same spot, your body, your mind thinks, well, that's right. But you're getting up, you're, in, you're at the gig, you're, there you are in your solo or whatever part it is, you're playing that section, 
you come into it and boom, you hit that wrong note again, or you just fuddle that section. But you were thinking, don't fuddle this section. Don't fuddle it. Here it comes. Don't fuck it up. You fucked it up, <laughs> right? The fingers and the brain go, dude, I don't care what you tell me right now because that's how you played it a hundred times and you repeated it like that. That's so, right, because the, um, the brain doesn't know what reality is. So if you visualize it being perfect, then when you play it, it will be perfect. But there's that healthy time out that you've got to give yourself. Any artist, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Even basketball players, I've seen this basketball teams. If they visualize the free throw is going to go in, it's going to go in, go in, go in, go in. Absolutely, and classic you, story. Right, then when you actually physically do the work, it, it, ha it happens. And uh, what's this? did Mike give you any tips on what techniques, presses he used to learn the track in a short space of time? Maybe before you answer that, I've just got a tip about this for Shine Shinebone Star. I think he was going to tell you. That's Brendan, actually. Hey, Brendan. All oh, right, cool. So here's yeah, a tip for he those. Yeah, just a genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a tip for you. So when I um, listen to uh, podcasts, so yeah. if anyone does that, I'm sure lots of people do. What you need to do is desensitize the brain to lot high volumes of information, and the best way to do that is try watching TV with two sources, right? Have two things going on because you have to, you, you know, this is how you grow your awareness. Basketball players actually do this and they get two basketballs and they practice dribbling with both both balls at the same time. You think, why would you even do that? It's because it's to over-sensitize the brain going, what the hell's going on? And then when they actually go into game mode, which is a completely different level of adrenaline and there's only one to worry about, it's easy. But to get back to the podcast, my story, I listened to podcasts at 1.5 times, yeah, one and a half too. times speed, Absolutely, because yes. I might miss some stuff and I might rewind, but I've been doing this for, for oh, maybe a couple of years now. But it helps um, get desensitized to lots of, lots of information. So anyway, what were you going to say about how did Mike... Well, he, he was just a genius. He just absolute genius. Uh, Frank, you know, Frank... Uh, he was just a genius, unbelievable. Um, and I don't have anything solid except, I guess, just talking music with him. But I want to, I guess there's a lot of things I absorbed from having conversations with these guys and trying to work out what I'd <laughs> learn at DIT <laughs> to what they'd learn. So one of the ways that I try to explain things and one of the things that I do with my, when I ask my students to practice, and one of the ways is that they have to do multiple things. And they're never allowed to look at the page at the same time. So they're never, they always have to be visualizing it and remembering it in a different way. The number one, they always have to track play with the backing track. So the backing track gets them having to play in time so that they're training their muscles, right? They're having to hear, they're also hearing sounds in the background that are relating to their notes. Because if you play B minor, C major, and you have a particular riff over that, and you play exactly the same riff over G, C, it'll sound totally different as long as you're got it based in the right key center and around the right glorious, beautiful notes of that key center. Right. And you can't hear that when you're practicing by yourself without any other things in the background. Now, the other thing that I basically say that I think actually is one of the most important things to do when you're practicing is to talk out loud. And the way that I kind of describe that is this. When you're practicing something, whether it be a song for the cover band that you're working in or, or you're, you're recording tomorrow at the studio and you're really just brushing up, you're in your comfortable environment or you're just doing your scales. You're in this very comfortable environment yes. where your brain, if we can imagine like a, 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 you know, a computer processor, has a certain amount of CPU available. And it might say, I have this much CPU right now for all this physical activity that you're doing and thinking, that which is playing this thing. Then suddenly, the next day, you go to rehearse it with the band for the first time, and we all remember that. We know the song so well, or, or we, and then we, or we go to our mates and say, check out what I learned yesterday. We spent three hours working on it, and you go to play it, and you can't remember it. You're just like, oh, it's gone. And you're like, you remember knowing it yesterday. You kind of remember where things were, but your brain is just can't even come up with the information. And the reason I like to explain it in a very kind of basic way is suddenly your brain said, Ha ha, this is all the process I have for you right now. Because suddenly you're thinking about what that person thinks or you're thinking about, oh, I hope I remember it or I hope I play it well. And so 
there's all these other things that your brain is doing and you learnt it with this much, you guess what? Your body needs that much to reproduce it and it can't do it with this much. So when you're in your comfortable environment, you need to find a way to change those resources. And one way to change them is to talk. So talking, and people will say, I oh, get, yeah, but I can talk. But how many guitar players that have never learned to do it are playing guitar, they get asked a question. They know the answer straight away in their head, but they have to stop. They're like, blah, blah, blah. oh yeah, man, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to the movies tonight. Blah, 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 and they're back in again. But they can't say what their brain knows because they can't move their mouth at the same time they're moving their fingers because it is it is moving muscles. So yeah. just talking while you're practicing, and it can be anything. It can actually be like kind of what you're talking about, having a book and reading the book while you're doing your scales with your backing tracks on in the background is yeah. phenomenal. When, then when you're in something in your live situation or you're under pressure, you, you, you can yeah. do it without even thinking about it. Like you said, on game day, one basketball, man, this is a piece of piss. Exactly, yeah. And I, I want to say also to maybe letting too many secrets out of the back, but with... Oh, you no, know, that, I've, I've just got to say on that one, Doug, if we can come back to there... Once yeah. it, when I went back to Melbourne and started teaching my course, it was a 10 week, it is a 10 week intensive, basically a three hour lesson. It was five hours back then because it was old school whiteboards and stuff. Yeah. But I remember some teachers in Melbourne saying, Nick, what are you doing? You, you, can't, you can't tell your students everything in, in like 10 weeks. And I'm like, well, actually, I can. But yeah, they're like, yeah. and what's wrong with that? And they're like, well, because. You need to keep giving them a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. You don't oh, yeah. give them everything. So then drip, you've got your students like going that. on and you've got all your people. On, and I was like, bullshit, come to me, get the information and please go away and just play your guitar and, and be at peace, you know? So what I wanted to say to that about letting the cat out of the bag is that with it might be like learning boxing or martial arts or whatever, you know, the theory and, and the action and then, you know, doing it. But what I find is that you have to do the grind. You have to actually play guitar and maybe watch TV. I know that sounds ridiculous. Some people may disagree and that's fine, but I'll tell you why I say this is because there's two motor skills happening and two sides of the brain's going on. So when you, you're doing your rhythm and you find it, I say fine motor skill, cool? Yeah. And like learning jazz chords or whatever, I've actually put a little lesson out there before about, you know, artificially stressing the brain to have yeah. um, an adrenaline surge because when your brain is under adrenaline, your senses work a hundred times better than they do any day of the week. That just is. It's a science. Yeah. Don't ask me to explain it, but I've experienced it. But getting back to my point is that you need to play under pressure. You know, you need to do lots of things at the same time and then you'll just Absolutely. be cool. And this is why I think playing music benefits being you know in the real world because we have stresses every day and just getting to is it shinbone star um if you send me a message please sir if you send me a message uh i will sort you out getting you online but um yeah getting oh thank you mark mark's a great player too um absolutely you've got to put the time in and if you love guitar why wouldn't you you know like yeah i love watching a movie and playing guitar it's it's fantastic and writing songs while you're doing that it's not the best when you're in a relationship, you know, and you've just started and you're <laughs> sitting down, you know, to watch a movie together and you grab your guitar and they're like, what's going on? <laughs> it's yeah. Kind of like, oh, yeah, babe, I'm watching a movie without you. And, <laughs> and I guess the, th the third point, when you have it um, inside out, back to front, the third thing, this is what I tell my students, you can see what a scale looks like on paper. That's visual. You yeah. can hear it. Cool, you can, might be able to sing it, cool. But that means nothing unless you know what it feels like, you know, num number three. So what I get my students to do if they're playing is that if I'm looking at this way, the, probably the easiest thing you to do is like actually turn around and get new visual stimulus, like turn 90 degrees in the room and t or turn around and, mm -hmm. you know, change the visual stimulus because when you process how the way the brain works, if you're watching TV, and here's an example, uh, if I do this uh or no i just i'll edit that here we go make it scroll so when something's moving uh, we feel like we're on the news now exactly so if donald trump was on the news and it says well sorry if there's a new re news reader on the news and it says donald trump blah 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 down the bottom 
we switch off audibly, like visual comes first. Because if you're driving and you see a red flashing light or a blue light, you react. Like you can't help it. Like it's a it's a, um, a motor skill that's, what do they say? It's uh, inbuilt. You can't, natural response. So I guess the third thing I just want to highlight is, yeah, kesthetically, there's three things learning an instrument. And this is why music is amazing is it helps you visually, audibly, and kesthetically at the same time. Like, that's music actually demands that. But yeah, what were you going to say, Nick? Absolutely. Not... Um, I don't know. It's gone now. <laughs> so <laughs> what else? Can, what else can we expect in your course? And I'll just see if I can sort out um, getting Shinebone to come in. I, can... It's kind of it's it's almost like it's hard to say because I kind of teach a lot. Like people say they want something, they want a certain. Well, what? Well, how can I? It's so hard for me to describe because it's an experience and. I remember before I had sex that everyone told me what it was going to be like, or I read what it was going to be like, feel like all of that stuff. But when I was having it, I was like, oh my God, this is nothing like I've, I was told it was going to be right. And, but then suddenly I had a foundation because I'd had the experience to actually know what I was talking about or to know what other people were talking about with my interpretation of it. So I remember there was a, there was a time with Steve went back to this improvisation thing where they do all these things. I'd be like, Steve, <laughs> I said this to Steve. I said, Steve, you're not actually really improvising. You're just playing your licks over and over again in the right key. And now you're in B flat and you're just playing them again. And I'm like, because I've learned so much of your stuff that I see the same finger motions happening again and again and again. Of course, with your absolute brilliance and super speed. And oh my God, you know, there's just his timing skill, you know, the way that he goes between sets of fives and three and his accent control and 17 and 13 and you know <laughs> like that's what makes him stand apart by someone else like i love john petrucci the john petrucci is very much very very much fast and beautiful melodies but very much sitting in one variation group. of time frames to another one very division group division yes yeah. so that aside back to this vice story i said Steve, you're just playing the same licks over and over again, mate, in the right key. He, he looks at me and he goes, I don't do accents. He goes, no, Nick, I hear a note and it tells me where to go next. Now, back to this experiencing, I had no idea what he was talking about. And I, in my head, I am said, oh, fucking bullshit, you're a wanker. You're just playing the same shit over and over again. Because I didn't know what he was talking about, the experience. So when you ask me about this experience in my class. Somewhere I started practicing a different way using visualization, um, memory things, talking out loud. And one day I hit a note and I just knew where to go. I actually didn't, I wasn't thinking scales anymore because I've got it. I was a player that learned from tablature and I learned from written music. I didn't learn by ear. I didn't learn the other way. So I learned from the left side of my brain. Yep because I was using intellect to learn, put your finger here, put this here, put that there. And I was hearing sound as a secondary thing where other players, they have learned to play from the right-hand side of the brain, meaning the creative side, where they actually have listened and imitated the sounds, which is ultimately, I believe the best way to learn first. And if you don't learn that way, you can actually never be a great player because it's like people that you see that have gone to the con you can see that they're brilliant players, but their soul and heart and something, the X factor missing in their playing because they haven't linked both sides of their brain. And then you have, by the way, good, I'm glad you're there, Justin. Justin and I actually, Justin and I actually played within a band way, way back, and we were good mates back in those days, in you know, 18, 19, 20. And Justin was this player, Justin, you were a player, and I've told you before, that I was blown away by what you could do but, and you knew nothing. You didn't know your you didn't know the names of your scales or all this stuff like I did. But as far as I'm concerned, you just blew everyone off the stage night after night because you had this most incredible feel. So you were one of these early players that I played with that went into this box of oh my god, how do they get that skill? And we all know that our mates as guitar players growing up that there's one guy that really has his shit together and plays amazing. I think if you go back and you go to those people and you talk about thanks, Dazzy, and you. And you talk about you t and you sorry you think about how they learned most of those people didn't go to teachers or had one or two lessons and went man that guy's a fucking wanker i'm not doing that shit. it's and an experience put, and they put music on and they imitated and copied that music 
entirely by ear. They listened over and over and over and over again. You know, we think about our favourites, all our players. Slash, you know, incredible player. I'll never forget the first time I heard the Gunners. I was like, I, I fell out of bed quite literally, like, holy fuck, what is this song? Um, yeah. You know, they all learnt by ear. And I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that. There's a um, technique. It's called the Suzuki technique. And the yeah. first three years is um, it's exactly that, you know, and they mimic mimic sounds. There's no, there's nothing notated. It's not visual at all. It's not a visual experience. You yeah. have to remember, you know, what whatever you, however way you want to, but it's all yeah. about mimicking the sound. And a lot of parents, <laughs> I'm just going to say it how it is, a lot of parents struggle with this concept. They go, no, but I want to see the songs that little Johnny and Sally is learning. And so, well, you can't do that. You can't, you know, uh, how do I say, visualize an experience. They have to have it. They need to just let them go. You know, how do you learn to swim? You need to, like, immerse yourself completely. And I think more to the point, how do you learn to stand? How do you learn to talk and how do you learn to walk? You just look at the humans around you and you watch them and you kind of fall over, you fall left, you fall right. You make mistakes on purpose. And then you kind of work out where the middle ground is. You know, but no one actually told us how to make the sound of an A. We imitated that sound. And then, right. you know, and that is the, our most natural way of learning as humans, watching, touching, and imitating. You know, by Immer- hearing. Being immer- immersed, immersion yeah. is probably the, yeah, I think, and you know, uh, I've been, I don't know if you know about this guy called Dan Pena at the moment. Uh, mm, I, no. I'm a fan, I, a fan of London Real, but he says this one word. Ah, uh, yes, okay, I lo- no London Real, but. I, okay, well, he says this, you know, show me your friends, show me a list of your friends, and I'll tell you your future. And so if you take that in a musical concept, you know, yeah. show me a list of the musos you're hanging around with. Yes, not not just talking about the records. Yes, we can have the Steve Vai, the Satriani, and the, you know, the Jeff Bax and stuff. But who are you actually hanging around? Like, who's actually motivating you because as what you just said before Mm. is that you know when you grow up there's always this one guy who can do something right Mm. that's that experience is the human factor you can't learn from a book that's called immersion you need to go out you need to go to the jam nights you need to get blown off the stage (laughs) i mean we all have like oh yeah (laughs) and you know like but that's what drives me to be better you know and yeah anyway that's what i wanted to say about the immersion is you need to have a think about who you actually hang around with, you know, like go and hang around with better players and you can't help but get better. Like what you were saying about the Keneally story and you know, how else he learns about that and what motivated you. Oh, sorry. You go, you answer that. I quick. mean, I took, you say what, what things do I learn on tour? And, and I think that that's something that I learned really importantly from talking with these guys is they learned in a different way. They didn't go to schools first and I had to turn around my whole thing, go shit. I've just gone to the best yeah. school in the world. And I still don't feel like I'm improvising. This thing that Steve's talking about, hitting a note and knowing where to go, I'm like, I just thought it was bullshit until I experienced it. And then when I, I looked back at that time I was living in, in Hollywood, because I lived in the States for two and a half years, and I yep. did about two years of touring with the guys um, wow. in between breaks and all of that. It wasn't never like straight out. It was like, you know, big summers. And um, and then a lot of time teaching private students and seeing what was working and what was not working while I was mucking around with these techniques. And with my surfing too, I took my surfing to a whole nother level because I was visualizing my surfing, the perfect wave. And suddenly I went out for a surf after that very first meditation of constructing the perfect wave while in my meditation, feeling my muscles twitch and want to make the mistake that I would make every time on a cutback. And then I went out and I surfed this, I surfed a couple of incredible waves that like an hour later and i remember over the next week all the surfers there in california that i was hanging out with they all were like dude what happened to your surfing like we've been surfing with you now for like eight months and we know how you surf and suddenly you've gone from this level to way up here and like what the hell have you done and it was visualization that did that so i kind of put all of this stuff into looking at the looking at chords and scales from a certain perspective but learning them a certain way and being very much like karate kid very much like um no you just do what i tell you to do i'm not telling you why here play to this track do this for five minutes to now do this for five minutes now do this for five minutes and then get them next week and go show me what you did for five minutes and we'd all do it together 
And then I go, now you're going to do this for five minutes this week. And you're going to, so every, and it was about five weeks in, everyone would be like the karate kid. I'm fucking sick of washing your car and painting your fences. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> I came here to fight, not play scales. But because yeah. they've been doing, like, you, like we've talked about, all this extra mental work in the background, they don't even know that their ear has been changing. Even guys that, that were, oh, and I've had people that, I've had a guy come to me, I can't think of his name right now. He, he called me on the phone and he's like, I'm like, yeah, hey, I, I saw your course in the paper. I'm like, yeah, what's your name, man? What have you been doing? It's like, well, I've been playing for 30 years and I've just got back from England where I was the session musician, guitar player at Abbey Road Studios for the last five years. And I'm like, well, I don't think you need my help. I'll talk to you later. See you, mate. And he goes, no, 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 hang on. He, he was like, look, I know what to play. I'm an ear player, but I don't know why I'm playing. And it just feels like I'm playing the same thing all the time. Right. So he's an example of an incredible player that's learnt from the right hand side of the brain by hearing auditory yep. and just knows and he knows feel and he knows what works, but he doesn't know why because he doesn't understand the theory. And those great players that actually Thanks, play like that, they actually don't want to learn that they want to learn the theory because they know there's something really cool there, but they see yep. the people that have learnt the theory and they don't want to be like them. They've seen theory destroy music in, in people's personal playing because they suddenly start thinking about what they're doing instead of feeling it. So yep. wax on, wax off. Yeah, so yeah. I, I kind of in myself, it was all about me. I, I was never, ever planned to be a teacher. All I ever wanted to do was be able to do this thing where I felt comfortable playing guitar. I felt comfortable improvising. I was writing. I wasn't having to always go to this sheet music. I just felt music, really, like this experience that Steve talked about. And, and I, when I fell on it by accident, I, I retraced my steps on how I got there with all these things I'd been using in surfing and blah, 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 like visualization, memory tricks, pushing the shit out of my brain, even though I didn't really know why at the time. I just went, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to try that. And then all my students started having the same experience in California. And that's when I went, oh, wow, I think I'm onto something. And I kind of yeah. wrote a uh, 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 I was going to write a book and try to get a deal with Hal Leonard to basically pay me so that I could take time off of, of doing anything and just focus on writing yeah. the book. But they were like, well, we, you know, we'd prefer to see the book first before we give you any money. <laughs> 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 Even though, so Mike had given me rave reviews and everything. Um, and Ruder had hooked me up, that's Steve's manager. But I, I basically became a father. I was back in Australia on tour and one of my old longtime girlfriends, Michelle, fell pregnant. So basically I got back girls you know back there wow until <laughs> back to the girls and i was in hollywood and i got a telephone call it's like from michelle say, from melbourne saying i'm pregnant and literally had that moment where my legs buckled and i slid down the wall and it was a really tough kind of like nine months but i was on i was actually on tour when i went back i was literally left tour flew to la and then flew to melbourne so i could see the birth of my son because that was not something i was going to miss out for anything wow. and you know, my plan was, you know, spend a week there after he was born, you know, and then fly back and jump back on tour again. I, I mean, I had an experience that you know, was amazing. That it was like setting a goal, holding that boy in my arms that I had never, ever set myself, you know. No matter yeah. how much I love guitar and what I achieved in America, this feeling was incredible. And I was like, I cannot not do this. So I went back to the States and I spent another six months just finalizing my affairs and came back to Australia. And that's when I was like, fuck what I've got to do. And that's when I started teaching my ideas. And that's when I wrote really crazily the course. And I literally was printing it out of the printer every week as the students came into class. And yeah. I have barely, barely changed the course since then, way back in 97. Um, and it seems to work really well. And yeah, I and what's, a lot of my can you just uh, maybe mention, mention your uh, website again? So it's uh, Visionary Guitar at visionaryguitar.com.au and okay. I'll just yeah. put about so visionaryguitar.com.au I'll just well we've got a guest uh, backstage I'm just going to put a little uh, visionaryguitar.com.au right is V-I-S-I-O-N-A-Y A-R-Y I think so I, re I really hope I spelt it right that'd be embarrassing how's that that is correct yeah oh there we go so I mean, I'm not really here to plug so much as 
too late. Basically say that I'm yeah, yeah too late. But I'm, I'm kind of like I'm more I'm you know I'm going to do some free lessons now that everything's changed around and suddenly I'm not going to be able to do live classes for a little bit and I'm I'm putting pressure on myself and I've been setting up this studio to do some live classes and I'm actually going to do them without context. I'm just going to jump on and whoever turns up turns up and what do you want to talk about while I'm yeah. while I'm filming the stuff. But I mean if there was anything that anyone here was going to take away, Doug, cuz I'm always about well, you got to get something. You got to get something awesome. And is that yep. pick your favorite song or your favorite solo and fucking learn it by ear only. Do not go to YouTube. Do not go to tablature. Just find one of those looping things that you can repeat. And if you've just got to repeat one note, did 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 to find that one note, like yeah. do that, and then find the second note, and then find the third note, and loop whatever you've got to do to work it out. And that experience, it might take you a week to learn like five, 10, 15 seconds of music is more important than learning like six new songs. Yeah, because on tablature or YouTube, because you got to learn the um, especially about memory, like the actual short term and medium term, long term memory has to be developed. That's, that's actually a process. You can't just pull out Van Halen today absolutely yeah because it'll be gone next week if you don't if you don't do it a little bit by a little bit yeah i agree with that well we've got uh mm. shinbone brendan i should say i haven't met brendan before so there we go we're just going to pull him on if he's got a question for nick here we go yes justin it is hello sir how are you man hey, nice guys. to see you, you? Uh, good hey good. brendan how you doing man good good am i coming through okay yeah you are look at those headphones <laughs> <laughs> so what? Uh, so you guys know each other, obviously, and do you have uh, a question or something? Or um, I, I did the course with Nick about awesome. um, 13, 14 years ago. Yeah, that was I was teaching oh. in Bean Lee for a little bit. That's correct. At the, in the Scout Hall. hall. <laughs> yeah. And it would be like, who's bringing beer this week, right? We really shouldn't say that, right? Because we can't encourage that. Too late. <laughs> That's right. Especially when so the get that out over. over. <laughs> so, Bre so Brendan, what did you find unique about Nick's way of teaching? I think for me, definitely focusing on the uh, the visualizations and, and the body memory and using those techniques. Um, I guess my situation, I was uh, up until that point a tab only player, so I hadn't yep. learned to develop my listening skills, so to speak. Um, I think the theory side of things definitely introduced at a level that made sense and um you know a number of the exercises and drills we would do were where so it wasn't just learning it was actually using them and i think um i think that also helped put a lot of things in perspective and, and i guess probably the main thing i got out of the course i learned early on and, and one thing i tell people all the time for me it was one of the things i really got out of it although a key point was it's not hard to sound good. It's just knowing what the right notes are to hit and when to hit them. And that's one of the things I learned and, and yeah. really focusing on, uh, cause I grew up listening to a lot of shred players and then after, and I knew that wasn't necessarily me, but I really, the focus out of that was learning to play something and thinking about your audience and, and thinking, okay, come up with something tasty. That's going to sound good to them. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Wow. Well. There you go. And I think, really... you know, learning things like I had a bit of a drive in the, um, to the job that I was doing at the time to get to. So sitting in traffic, sitting at the traffic lights, thinking about, okay, scale positions, um, yeah, visualizing chords, doing all your chord arpeggio scale drills, using, trying to utilize that, I guess, spare time and, or, you know, non-usable right. time or what you yeah. treat it as non-usable and thinking, well, what can I do with that? I've got an opportunity here. Let's start thinking about it and mm. and and applying that to your playing. I really like what you said about, you know, take being opportunist about your time because like when are you a musician, this is what I tell my students, all the time. So if you're listening to the birds tweeting, you know, start or the cricket, like start tapping the rhythm. I mean, Grant Collins transcribed four crickets and he's he could play it with like four limbs. I don't know if you know who Grant Collins is, a Brisbane drummer. Mm amazing no, no. but um yeah so that's that's mindset is about when are you a musician all the time so you're always learning and even okay. uh the mm. the record i just did 
uh, Never Ever Want to Know is track number one. So I lifted, this is called prosody, lifting the rhythm and the inflection, or it's called intonation, no, never ever want to know. So that's the actual mm. melody, but I lifted that from words, right? It, how we mm. say it. But anyway, but uh, I like and what I you think, said uh, about that. Well, a good point you guys raised before about uh, you know playing in front of the TV, um, utilising that time, um, you know, whether it's a jingle on, on an ad or something in a TV show and whether it's just... You know, Absolutely. strumming to it, or uh, or trying to pick up the melody, and also um, using that as an opportunity to spend time with your better half while playing guitar. They think they're getting, a, they think they might be getting a good deal out of it. You are, too. you just don't tell them that. Uh, right. <laughs> but, yeah, pick so up babe, what are we watching from tonight? There, of course. <laughs> But I think out of that, that probably turned me um, doing the the course. Certainly turned me in going from a tab player to someone that was starting to listen more and use my ear and get to that point where you know you're playing regularly enough and you're hearing stuff and then you're you know um, thinking I know where I've got to go on my guitar neck next time I pick that up and and you know I think one of the it's one good. of the classes we were doing um, <laughs> well I think that well, one of the tracks we listened to was was Led Zeppelin the Ocean and I remember you you. We're talking about it, we're listening to it, and immediately I thought, hey, I've just worked out this opening riff. And um, it was easy, but just, um, you know, a lot of things we went in through there, learning, looking at, I guess, transposing and transcribing yourself, tips to work songs out. You know, these days, I guess it's a lot easier because, um, you know, back then you didn't have a lot of the YouTube internet tools. You know, a lot of the internet tabs were pretty bad back then anyway. But, you know, a lot of good things. And that was a big thing for me, going from a tab player that was trying to be, I guess, a perfectionist. I had to, you had to learn it note for note or, and, and then going to something. And, and then you soon work out, well, depending on your audience, unless you've got a shred head there that's looking right at you and going, oh, okay, well, he's done the wrong fingering here or hit a bum note, you know, especially if you're playing at a place where a lot of people are, you know, drinking beers and listening to good music, they're not going to know. They're looking you. for girls. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> oh, boys. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, you know, if they're so, good yeah. girls at the show, there might be a singer. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I really like that, that feedback you're saying, Brendan. And maybe, uh, Nick, do you want to say anything about how Brendan um, absorbed and maybe changed his mindset during the course? Do you remember that? Well, I, I, he pretty much summed it up pretty well there. Um, it was always, there was, Brennan was always hanging out with, you know, some of the top players that, who would come through town. It doesn't matter who it was, Brennan suddenly was hanging out with them. And then, geez, Brennan, like there's some stories, that's for sure. So, but just, you know, it's kind of hard to say on each one's transition in playing because we basically would run around and I would kind of be, it wasn't about, hey, you show me what you can do and now I'll show you what I can do. It's like, do this drill and do it like this. I'll see you next week kind of scenario. And, and you know, sharing time was in between and people shared their stories, of course, how things were transitioning for them. But the funny thing about the course is that when, when the moment hits, the aha experience, it happens at different places for everyone. And generally people will communicate with me a year and a half after they've done the class and they've gone, oh my God, I can't believe it. This just happened. Or like um, Greg said before, 15 years later, you're still playing and you're still thinking about it in a certain way. You kind of your approach or kind of everything changes. And as you asked me about the experience before, Doug, I can't really describe it as you'd know, Brendan, because it's not what you expected when you went in. You thought, I wish it could be this good. And I'd like to think that it is way better, but it's not better like in this direction, it's better maybe in this direction over here that you didn't even know existed. Yeah. And you might remember, I was always the guy that hung around, helped you pack up, and I was constantly picking your brain, asking questions. And Absolutely. You know, if I didn't... Finish the beer. Yeah. <laughs> if I did, yeah. If, <laughs> maybe the leftover Tim Tams. Um, but if, I, if there was something I didn't know, and, you know, and you know, Nick and I are obviously still in contact to this day and um yeah, somewhere yeah. along that journey uh along came remco yeah. oh wow well i must yeah. i just want to maybe add to that uh brendan about what you're saying about hanging around because the old ad adage or the old story i should say about you know getting a job in a massive studio and being the coffee runner and all that kind of thing 
Mm. It's not about the task. It's about being exposed to people for 20 years and becoming part of the, you know, the, the brain click, you know, or learning, mm. absorbing, I should say, absorbing all the knowledge. It's not about the actual task because playing guitar, you can just do it with two hands. Anyone can do it. It's just that if you spend time and effort, right? But I really like what you said about hanging around people because it's not just learning the licks from Nick or learning the scales. It's actually being absorbed, his mindset. How do you learn anyone's mindset from YouTube? How do you learn, how, how do they deal with a bad day? I mean, like any artist goes goes like this, you know, like it, it's a fact of life. And I, I think it's beautiful that you just said it's, you actually absorbed it. And for whatever it was, you started right at the bottom and just kept, you know, absorbing. Because I worry about the future of music because the old master and apprentice concept, it's fading with YouTube, you know? It's a really, you- really interesting perspective, yeah. Um, I've never actually thought about that perspective. My view take probably on what YouTube is doing. Um, but yeah, not thought about that. I'm not really too worried about the future of music within reason, of course. Yes. Because like, there is some amazing stuff still <laughs> happening in the background. There's, you know, there's people like Guthrie Groven, you know, that are just, besides what he's now teaching people, as Justin talked about earlier on. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> nice one, Greg. <laughs> is, you know, he's talking a really, great line to people as well um there are real gems coming out of the internet thing and there is there is definitely an ability to get to someone different at a much lower cost and to go at your to go faster than maybe you could go seeing a teacher half an hour at a time but yeah and i do give it i do give it to youtube that it gets people playing their favorite songs kind of fast but there's got it i think they all hopefully get to a point where they go oh I, I'm, I, I'm not getting anywhere, but they may be the people that give up guitar. They're not the ones that actually it's in their blood and they just doesn't matter what. They just, they look at a guitar and their heart just go, beats faster, you know? They want to <laughs> yeah. own another one, you know? And then yeah. you've, got a, you know, you've got 10 and you're like, but I can only play one. Or, or right. then you go, maybe I should actually learn how to play one instead of having lots or, I don't so, know. It's, I, yeah. No, 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 no. I was well. I just wanted to say that maybe for the next generation. I, I guess uh, Brendan, you're a teacher as well. I assume. Do you teach no, anyone? I'm a boring okay. accountant. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Like but um, maybe uh, maybe two more two more questions, and we'll probably wrap it up because we're like ninety minutes in, which has been awesome. Um, the future of music. You know, back in the day, I was like anti guitar hero. I was like, oh, why are these kids learning this thing? But however, I've uh, grown my mindset. And, you know, I think it's good because, you know, guitar and music, when I grew up, it was the thing for all the teenagers to do. And, you know, and before that, in the 60s, it was probably drugs. And before that, you know, uh, the piano, let's talk about the piano. Like everyone used to have a piano in the lounge room and everyone used to be able to read. And, you know, they call it the lounge room because that's what they used to do. They sit around the lounge and someone would play the piano, right? Yeah. But then... You know, uh, a value of a good teacher is priceless. That's very true. And, um, you know, anyway, it new instruments came along in the 50s and the 60s and jazz came and gone and it re- recording came, blah, blah, blah. I'm getting to my point is that music, live music had its place, but now it's all about com- computer games. So this is why I've changed my perception because I teach kids who are like 14 or 15 now and their bass technique it is like some of them have to start like really, really at zero. And I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm just saying it's good that um, Guitar Heroes was around because they're exposed to Led Zeppelin. They're exposed to some really, really cool music that they probably wouldn't have been. So I'm just asking maybe, Brendan, if you want to go first, what's your thoughts to, to Guitar Hero game or not to Guitar Hero? What do you think? Um, I think it's probably... Uh... I was probably a bit anti-guitar hero myself to start. I played the game not for long. Um, but I think you're right, it had, has intru- introduced a lot of people into music they probably wouldn't be uh, listening to. Um, you know, probably on that, there's also a lot of different, um, you know, iPads and, and there's a lot of apps on there now which are helping teach people the instrument. You know, we've got a piano in the lounge room at home just seen, and I oh, found that awesome. my, my son uh, likes the music of Queen. 
So, um, and Michael Jackson. So, go into the lounge room and someone's playing, he's playing Beat It on the piano. And, Fantastic. Uh, like, wow. And so that's evolved from him into using things uh, like GarageBand and making his own songs um, as well. So I think having all this technology out there and is if, you know, and I've always made a point of playing music in the house. Uh, and, you know, that's how I grew up as well. And Modelling, you know, modelling. Yeah, that's great. Their own, and that's not to force something on them. Yeah. Um, so Spotify, um, listening to music in the car and, you know, they can make up, they're free to make up their own minds. But, you know, when you walk in a lounge room and you, you've got three kids singing the chorus to shout it out loud, you know, uh, parenting done right. So, but, you know, I've tried to do them as all that. My wife was a uh, uh, music teacher at school as well. So hence the piano. And um, so we certainly had the encouragement coming from that angle. But I, I think the, the the resources, whether it's games, apps, certainly... I, now I'm probably looking at them in different light and seeing them in a positive thing and it gives people access to that exposure that they might not have had it almost or might yeah. might also give people I guess the idea or something they hadn't thought about before yeah I might want to play an instrument or I like these songs you know yeah. can I go to that next level and start learning them you know what what's out there to help me do that yeah oh that's good and what do you want to say to that Nick to guitar hero or not to guitar hero the game. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of what um, Brendan said, and definitely that exposing people to music. And let's not forget Metallica. What, it wasn't just um, Led Zeppelin on there. Um, no, right, I think I think it's probably what I realised with a lot of people that never play with a metronome is when they try to play with a metronome, whether it be a beginner's or even semi-advanced, semi-advanced, I say, they knew their stuff, um, is that their actual brain didn't have the facility to actually hear that click going on while they were doing something with their body. So when it comes to, they had to learn that connection or to, to be able to hear that and be able to move with that. So there's no doubt the Guitar Hero, people had to move physically in time and they had to coordinate you know, their fingers to hit certain buttons. It, so while I would say there's no direct translation from the physicality muscle memory of doing Guitar Hero to playing the guitar, the area of the brain that has to listen and coordinate in time would definitely be trained. And so I think on that front, besides all the, you know, going, I actually want to play a real guitar now that I've had so much fun doing this, or I've been playing with mates and I've got that adoration of pulling off a song that no one else could, um, or <laughs> us all jumping around together because our mates got the drum, and then there was a screaming girl over there. Let's yeah. not forget that. Right? <laughs> I want to play the real thing. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I think that raises a good point to it. If you're serious about playing the instruments and, you, and you, you know, you've got uh, game consoles as well, like like I do, and uh, which I don't play very much because I got to a point where I said to myself, hey, do I want to be better at playing the Xbox or do I want to be a better guitar player? Right, yeah, but I guess the other thing I didn't think of with the whole Xbox situation is that it's technically social, right? So when they are trying to outdo each other, hopefully that plants some positive seeds for later in life to pick your transfer to the real instrument. Because I agree with you, Nick, the motor skills playing an Xbox to actually playing a guitar, I think, are irrelevant. However, the musical memory of like, oh, yeah, I know this solo goes, -da 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 -da. you know, I see these kids playing Dragon Force. It's like, it's cool. It's cool that they actually listen to the solo that intensely. And uh, what's his name? Uh, what's his Lee? Someone Lee? Herman, Herman Lee. Is Herman, Herman Lee, Lee. yeah. Um, I think it's great. It's great for them to, you know, kids paying attention to the technical stuff. But uh, anyway, I'll just move on to the last question. So maybe what, maybe you want to start, Brendan, is maybe what uh, point, you know, that you could pass on what maybe... Let's make it two points you would pass on for anyone learning an instrument. Positive points. What would you get them to do? Um, be open to uh, researching and um, immersing yourself in the information that's out there. I don't necessarily have a technique for. Uh, I think so. Or I, a, totally I guess uh, why I go about, you know, separating the good from the bad. I think you've got to go through some, um, you know, the bad comes with the good as well. Yep. 
Um, I think you've, you know, start to think about what you like and, and what you enjoy. And yeah. I guess the big thing for me, which has been, I mean, it's taken me probably 15 years to realize this is, um, make time, make sure you're making time to do the things you enjoy. So, um, if you're going to, um, which I've certainly been guilty of not get dedicating the time and it becomes a bit of a hobby on the run. And then you know, what you're looking at is getting your, I would probably the main point I would suggest trying to get your life in some kind of balance so you can, I guess, give yourself the opportunity to, you know, immerse yourself, Thanks, learn, and well, apply Greg. what you've learned. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's well said. And Nick, how about yourself? I was unsure how I was going to answer this question, in, <laughs> except for a few things that you said. Brendan, I, re- I was going to say, number one, you've got to have fun. But how do you have fun when you have this view that, oh, I have to practice the piano, I've got, I don't have half an hour right now. And a really big, I think the most important thing is when you look over there and you see your guitar sitting there in the corner or hanging up on the wall, hopefully, and you look at it and you go, oh, and the kettle's boiling, grab it. Don't look at your phone. Don't look at Facebook. Don't look at your text. Just grab that guitar and play it for 30 seconds or two seconds. And even when you're learning something, that D chord, for example, as a total beginner, put your fingers on it and try to make it right. Put your fingers on it, try to make it right. And as soon as your brain is no longer in the moment, put the guitar down and go and do it. And do that multiple, multiple, multiple times a day. So it's always fun. And when it's not fun, when it's not your dedicated practice time, then move on. Treat it a bit like a baby. When a baby's learning how to, how to walk or stand, it stands, falls, stands, falls, stands, falls, by the way, and it makes mistakes. That's really important too. It's okay to be wrong. In fact, sometimes if a keyboard just go bang, 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 and don't give a shit what notes you hit, because if you were, if you were someone who had never, ever, ever heard music in your life and never been conditioned to what was right and wrong, yeah. We, you hit any of those notes together and you would be blown away by how incredibly amazing it sounds. And yeah. so try to come from that amazing place sometimes, but back to the kid yeah. thing. Kids learn how to stand they, until their brain goes somewhere else and they look over there and they go, toy. Yeah. And then they crawl over to that toy, they start playing and then they go, oh, wall, I can try to stand on that. And for me, again, we're talking about learning an instrument it's got to be fun. And, e- and even us that know how to play them, kind of, you know, mostly, it's still got to be fun. So when you yep. force yourself to go and play, it's no fun. So I, I go, well, what, I'm a, what am I going to do? Just play guitar for a few moments. There's a, there's a pause in life right now. You're waiting for your kids or your partner to get ready to walk out the door. Have that guitar nearby, grab it, and just sit there and go bang, bang, bang on it. And then you, might, and then you fall in love again because you just... Or, or you fall in love with what you're doing because you're not forcing yourself to do something for too long when you don't want to be there. We're not at school anymore with the teachers wrapping us, making us stay there. Yeah. So I think that's... I, I, think, the um, things. Hmm. I think if I can add another point, Doug, which I didn't mention before, I think another yeah. thing, which is one of those, if I knew back then what I do now is... <laughs> yeah. um, I, and I'd certainly... <laughs> Brendan, I certainly... get more chicks on those tour, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. I think this is an aspect of the, the class because um, when I did the course, because it was a, a group session, was um, I would have said to myself back then, um, instead of practicing in the bedroom until you think you're good enough to go join other people, mm. get out, meet some fellow musicians, friends, communicate with people, and practice with somebody else. And I think yeah. that is also a good form of, you know, improvement mm. absolutely yeah go to a jam night yeah not waiting yeah. until you think you're good enough to because when are you good some enough? that learning ah because... oh, i yeah i still feel that you know and it's yeah. only when you some of that learning on the spot and uh putting yourself in that moment well hey it's also a good test for okay well what don't i know here what have i got to work on to go forward yeah well i i just want to add about uh ergonomics and you know as you probably all know when you go to the bathroom when, or you use a shower or a toilet, everything's out of the way, it's easily accessible. So I tell all my students, when you have a guitar, and not that they make their bed, and just being real here, put your guitar on the bed. And why? Because when you come home from school, you have to physically pick it up and move it. And the That's other, awesome, so that, I like that. 
Yep. So that means they're handling the instrument. And then the, other, the second tip for people learning guitar is for, maybe for parents is that I see a lot of kids conditioned um, it, in this way. I'm actually, I'm actually working on a YouTube video on this right now for my Lex guitar lesson. So I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. Is that so when kids do something, it, let's say they learn a riff, the white stripes. Cool. They've learned a riff. They got that little thing down. And I love the song, actually. I love the simplicity of it. I still do it a lot, my, the song myself. But what happens is mum and dad will say, oh, that's amazing. You know, come and play that song. Then mum and dad get sick of it. They're like, oh, my God, they're playing that song again. They've been doing it for four weeks. It's driving me nuts. Then what happens is the child is actually conditioned that, you know, actually practicing it. Because there's one point, as, as we all know here, learning the motor skill in thinking about it but that next bit that happens it's like boxing when you learn your learn your thing when you step in the ring you're not thinking about i'm going to do a left hook or an uppercut it just happens because you're going to be in the state of flow so when a student is actually in that state of flow and they've practiced the song ten thousand times they never get there the state of flow when they're like you know on the couch upside down playing their little riff because mum and dad stop it they actually hinder the actual process of practicing intensely. So all I can say is mum and dad push through that next bit because they will learn the next song when they're ready. <laughs> but if you, if you mm -hmm. stop them from doing it, they will stop themselves because then when they turn 15, so when they do that, when they're six, they go, yes, yeah, sir, I've already, I've already learned the song. Well, no, you haven't because you can't keep time and you're not doing that. Right. But yeah, I already know it. But they're conditioned, so I'm just finding I have to spend a lot of time to adjust their perspective. Anyway, that's a long-winded story, but that was my tip. Anyway, it's actually but, um, a really interesting one, Doug. That, um, thanks for sharing that. That's that's really cool. Just getting to that point where you know those notes so well that you start having fun with them. Exactly. Yeah, and I've you seen, start seen... making up your own music or going on. Suddenly, you're in the flow. Right, that's yeah. what we're talking about. Flow. Getting Steve Vai is all about that. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, I might just um, wrap so it don't up. hang up. Yeah, yeah. So don't <laughs> hang up, guys. But uh, do you want to maybe quickly say your uh, socials there, Nick? Pack some antibiotics. <laughs> I, I reckon. Uh, check out. <laughs> Thanks, Dustin. I'm, I'm on either Nick Tongue on Facebook or basically everything's Visionary Guitar on. Um, Facebook and Instagram and that, but I have been, I've had my head in the non-social world and I haven't posted for ages because social media scares me because I see so many people and that's all they do. And I'm like, I barely got enough time to play guitar. I don't have yeah. time to necessarily look at this stuff. And the reason I am not actually teaching as much as I did, I, I used to run three classes a week and that's all I did basically, um, besides gigs and the like. And then because it went from I'd advertise print media and then I'd just get enough calls to fill classes to suddenly mm. social media and now you have to be posting on a regular basis every day, every week and saying something amazing. And it's and so what, what am I saying? I now have to enter that world because I realise as I'm now ready to start teaching again and, and embracing this area of my life and my mission, I have to do this other thing. I guess yeah. it's like changing. Well, strength. you've started. You've Tuning started. Tonight's car. number one. <laughs> I have absolutely. This is my first live. Thanks, um, Doug, for having me on. That's Thanks, cool. Remco, for setting that up. Yeah, Remco, thank you for that, and uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, I don't know if you've got any socials as well. Do you have a band page or anything like that you want to mention? No, not at this stage. You can you can find me at Shinbone Star on Facebook or Twitter. Star okay, cool. R. All right. Thank you for that. And um, all right, I'll just don't go anywhere. I'm just going to pull you from the feet. I'm going to wrap it up and be with you in a sec. But, I, but before I pull you, I just want to say uh, thank you, Nick. It's been all, it's been an honour, actually. Uh, I really appreciate not just the knowledge, but also the psychology of the art that you're actually you know teaching in people. So I really hope people get involved in your course, man. That's awesome, and sensational. Don't forget why we picked up the guitar, the girl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. All right, I'll see you guys shortly. See you, Doug. Yeah. See everyone. Okay, cool. So um, I just want to say, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Doug DeJong. Well, actually, it's youtube.com slash Doug DeJong. And also Doug DeJong Music on Facebook. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. This has been very enlightening. So please like and share. And so show some love. I'll see you again.
next time from the guitarist rock and roll <laughs>